Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we're going to have a fun time tonight. We have two great guests. We have uh, Tom Wheeler and Dave Foley. Uh, they have a great podcast in UFOs. We're going to be talking about that a little bit and so much more. I was very impressed because I was on their show a while back and uh, how much they knew about the topic. It was, uh, it's, and they're really kicking it with their show. They're doing a great job. Uh, so uh, anyway, I will be introducing them in just a minute for the blog. This week, we have hovering assailants reported in Peru in 2023 and before. Thanks to all who support the show. Anyone can do that over at podcastufo.com, where we have a new blog every week and uh, some other interesting things over there. Check it out. And uh, I am going to bring in our guests because I'm just really excited to talk to them both. (laughs) Now, uh, Dave is doing this purposely for uh, Kate, or did at, you say yes. you're doing this for Kate? At yes. your request, Kate. At my request. At yes. your request, Martin. At, at your request, Kate, and my request. Yes. Yeah, she this lives. is uh, his Danish Graves imitation from Fargo. Yes. Perfect. Unfortunately, yeah. I didn't keep my eye patch. Um, so, uh, but I did. But I did. I did keep the white hair. So. <laughs> now I can't believe that you were on a set. And you only had one eye patch. I I I can't. I don't remember ever seeing a second eye patch. We must what have had a budget. Yeah, are they dealing with there in its, it's fifth oh, season it's of tight. Fargo? For God's sakes, it's very very <laughs> tight. Uh, you know, we had you know the people at MGM uh, were we were very they, you know, down to the, the minutest detail. Eye patches go for what two yeah. bucks? I, how many? I, I how think they need to get an eye patch. Well, that know. one, yeah, but that one was gray and it, you know it looked a little stylish. Mm-hmm. Probably had a little you know, texture. I think it to was. It. Was it suede? Yeah. It looked like suede. No, no, I think it was just sort of uh, a cloth of some kind. So Pleathera. Suede. Yeah. Yeah. It maybe. was the one. It's the one. Uh, yeah. Noah Hawley, the showrunner, uh, picked it personally. I, I had uh, <laughs> done my, my wardrobe tests uh, with a different eye patch, and Noah said, No, I like the white one. So, Dave, could, well, you, if you, could you read the cue cards with your one eye? Because I know you don't memorize lines. I know you make yeah, well, actors yeah, it, wear them on their chests or, you know, I mean, I know you. I Very did. What, uh, I did. If you look closely, I did what uh, 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 Marlon Brando did in that that final movie he did, uh, Don Juan de Marcos. Was that it? What it was uh, some, That's probably in the uh, range. Yeah, where he just managed. He just wore Walkman headphones for the whole movie, <laughs> and they just fed him his and lines for the Walkman him. headphones. Yeah. yeah. So that's what yeah. If you look closely. I'm wearing. Say Walkman that again. Headphones. Say that again. Yeah. 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 All the best method that. actors uh, yeah. do that, Dave. So you have nothing to be ashamed. I just didn't know yeah. if your if your you know long range vision could hand you know. The, the, the biggest that. the biggest impairment was driving uh uh driving the uh, really really expensive Porsche in the snow uh with oh one God, eye yeah and with my bad <laughs> eye uh, my eye with my worst vision this one's this eye's terrible this this eye's not so bad you know but if I'd done this one I'd be fine but did it, they select your eye did they tell you which I, eye it was I, no I did you good lord oh wow you. well you I know if no one was in continuity that day you could have switched it over and no one would. You know, oh, I, no one went off. I, sir, yeah. am an editor's actor. Uh, <laughs> I never make continuity mistakes. I may not. <laughs> my I, my line deliveries might be shitty, um, <laughs> but my continuity is always perfect. Did you have a backstory for your eye? No, no. All I said in the uh, said in the uh, uh, stage directions uh, is they when they introduced the character is from from a childhood injury. That's mm. all. Oh, and, I and, I figured that. Yeah, yeah could have been no anything. Okay. Chimpanzee no attack could have been anything. No, I look. I'm, look, I mean, we're, I look move the merch. Oh yeah, move there's the, the really mug. Okay, right. now we're so talking. you guys, you, you when did you start that uh, the podcast really, and and how did that all come together? How long has it been now? Uh, was it, was it was like, like it's last, been a last century fall? and a half that I've been doing this with you. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, I think we're about we're almost thirty shows in. Uh, and it's been lovely. Every every conversation had. So, I mean, the backstory of that would be uh, we, we, my wife, Chrissy, our producer, Dave, we all know each other from years back and um, and are always sort of checking in sometime, you know, and Dave moved to New York and there was a whole I, I hadn't talked to him in a while. And then um, my wife was saying, well, Dave really has just got, you know, he's been talking about UFOs and whatever. And for a minute, I was thinking, like, is everything, is everything OK? You know, is the, you know, Dave, what's what's going on with the UFOs? And Dave, like, is he, um, subsequently, we had a dinner because I've always been 
um, I, I sort of, I went through waves in my life where I was incredibly uh, interested in the topic and then, and then I would kind of leave for a bit, but I was vaguely aware of some of the significant um, kind of movements in the, in the, in the uh, culture toward this, but we had a dinner and it was really fun and interesting. And I had the chance to catch up, Dave and I did. And he had just been having really interesting conversations with some very fascinating people. And the story was just getting deeper and richer. And I realized how little I knew and how much there was to know and how intriguing it had gotten and just all of that. So I was, um, and, and I think at the dinner, very casually thrown out there, well, you guys should do a podcast together. And, and um, it sounded, it sounded like yeah. a great way to hang out with my buddy, Dave. And yeah, that was up at Pache, wasn't it? It was at Pache in, in La Laurel Canyon. Uh, Beautiful Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Yes. Hey, well, uh, stomping grounds. When I started, at first I started like an antique and art podcast in 2009. And it took weeks to put together a podcast, to figure it all out and how to get it on Apple and all that. I mean, I'm talking weeks with help, not, yeah. you know, I mean, it was so hard to do. And then in 2011, when I started the UFO podcast, it was podcast UFO, I should say. It was extremely easy compared, but it still took days and days to do. It was not easy. And now yeah. they're popping up like crazy everywhere. You can just I don't know. There's so many places you can well, I, pop yeah, up a when, podcast. The UFO podcasts started, are popping up every day. You know, yeah. Well, when, they were, when podcasting first started, I remember you had to know how to set up an RSS feed. That's right. Feed. I had uh, to pay someone to set up an RSS feed. Yeah. That's right. And you, yeah. and then you had to figure out how, and if you wanted to listen to one, you had to figure out how to do it. And then suddenly uh, Apple started adding podcasts to iTunes. And, uh, and then it's kind of all exploded from there. So it was really Apple's fault. Hey podcasting. Tom, did you did you see the private chat? I did. I'm trying to turn yeah. down the mic. You're trying to do that. Okay, guys. Yeah, we're we're better. trying to trying to figure out your mic. Uh, so we have someone in the Chanel. will take a look at it, see how you sound now. Thank you. Should I, should I uh, drive over? I Dave's only block yeah. away. If you get your canoe, Dave, and yeah. uh, and yeah, head on over, guys, that would be great. You guys are having terrible flooding and rains. Twelve well, feet depends high. On the, depends the on your river. opinion of flooding. Some people would say we're having great flooding. Blood, <laughs> blood fans, incredible blood flooding. fans are really excited about yeah, it. My, yeah. the, uh, the streets fans. overflow. It's, uh, yeah. Why do you have to make a judgment call on it, Martin? Well, <laughs> you could true. probably grab an inner tube and come on down um, as well. I don't think I think you would be yeah. supported all along the way in the yeah. class three rapids. Yeah, um, but yeah, the, uh, yeah, the LA yeah, River is is overflowing its banks, which it's aren't Amazing. real banks. It's a big, I was telling Martin ugly, before we started, thing. we had tree le like uh, rescue choppers were coming in at tree level over the house uh, a few times yesterday to pluck folks out of the LA River. Um, mm -hmm. Oh wow! Which uh, hopefully everybody got out safely. But uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean, I now how of, would people get into the LA River? You're not, not talking like the homeless situation. Not pleasantly. Um, yeah, yeah. It may. It may. Uh, it may. Yeah, I don't know who who it was. It's not normally a great swim in the LA river. It's normally a bit of a sort of nasty trickle, but, um, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Or nothing. I, yeah. It may have been transient. I don't, I yeah. don't know usually, who was in there. It's usually a great place to go skateboarding. Uh, uh not yeah, that that's right. Been, but yeah, but it's yeah, not I've much of that. a river most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, so I got, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say in, re in regards to the podcast and setting it up, we were very lucky. We have partners at uh, stampede Productions. So once we had decided to, kind of try this out. Um, they were really happy to partner up and provide us kind of with the infrastructure and, and some help and a, and a lovely little studio at their, um, at their base of operations. So we kind of, we were lucky in that regard and they've, they've been helpful in yeah. kind of getting us out to all the Cause, cause channels and outlets. screenwriters so that helped. Um, oh, I don't know if that yeah. had anything to do with yeah. it. They were much yeah. more happy, like they, you know, to have, uh, Dave Foley involved in the the whole situation. They knew me. I was I was old news at that point. But. Yeah, and I I just actually just made a movie for uh, Stampede right before. That's we true. You did doing this movie called Space Cadet with Emma Roberts. Uh, okay, there's awesome. another uh, uh, Tom. Take another read on the new message there. See if you can uh, look at that a little bit. So I ask you, Dave. Dave, how long is your interest? been in the ufo topic well as i said it's kind of lifelong 
um, but it's got it's gone up and down in terms of seriousness. I mean, my awareness of UFOs began with the Jerry Anderson TV series from the night from 1971 called UFO. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Which was a British series, and I'm as a kid, I watched that show. Every, loved that show because uh, it, it, it portrayed a, a super modern future world uh, of 1983. Um, <laughs> and everyone drove around in gullwing cars and wore like uh, stretchy, er, got stretchy pantsuits. And there were ladies on the moon with, in, in miniskirts. Um, so it was a very exciting. It's a future uh, I dream of. But they had these conical uh, <laughs> UFOs that they were battling every week. Um, and, uh, you know, in a secret layer built underneath a movie studio. And so that was my first awareness of UFOs. And, and then, uh, you know, then I guess later there was also a series with Roy Thin is called, uh, strange invaders. I think it was called, no, invaders, well, invaders. Called invaders, invaders. Yes. Yeah. With Roy Thinnis, who once made a wonderful guest starring, uh, uh, role in, in a few episodes of the X-Files. Um, hmm. but, uh, it, so that was that. And then, you know, as I, you know, got older, you know, was interested in it and uh, would watch doc, you know, the documentaries here and there. And then I kind of got more serious about it when the, the Phoenix lights happened uh, back oh, yeah. in 97, 97. Yep. And that kind of went, went, Oh, well that's, uh, I'm not buying the government's explanation of this. That doesn't make any sense. And which yeah. maybe start to question, well, well maybe I need to rethink things like Roswell and, you know, maybe take it all a little more seriously. And then a little while after that, it was the uh, French put out the Cometa report, uh, which was a, a, you know, a study they did, which yeah. involved police, military, uh, psychologists, uh, and scientists. Um, and they came to the conclusion, oh, they came to the conclusion, UFOs are real. And the most probable explanation is extraterrestrial. Uh, mm. And and this seemed like a pretty important a piece of work that no one paid any attention to in the rest of the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I thought, well, that's interesting. And then, but then uh, I guess I really, really started diving deep after I saw uh, James Fox's out of the blue documentary. Oh yeah. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. That and still that, holds up and yeah, he's not great. happy with it. He, no. he, you know, when I've talked to him about it, he says, no, nah, that, Hey, oh God, I, you know, I do everything different this time, you know. Well, he did know, with I, the phenomenon. He, I know he did he, very, very well with that. Yeah, yeah he basically made made the, uh, yeah. updated, made the same movie updated and yeah, and, uh, with more money. Uh, yeah, because I know what he means. There was, you know, that, but but it was the first documentary I saw that that seemed to be journalistic and mm. serious, and you know, and it had Peter Coyote uh, narrating. Right. Um, yeah, and he also can't go wrong with him. Yeah, and he narrated. Uh, you know, if you can't get Henry <laughs> Fonda, get Peter Coyote. I mean, Peter Coyote's the man. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So that's that's when I, I got really that because that was my first time I was exposed to stories like Malmstrom Air Force Base and all that, you know, and, and um, you know, the uh, the Iranian fighter pilot and, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, so all, yeah, well, all these great like this this really credible uh, witnesses that I didn't know about. And then I started, you know, seeking out, uh, you know, uh, podcasts and things online. And that's when I when I discovered you and alejandro rojas and uh yeah and uh and ryan uh, sprague you ryan see. sprague yeah. yep yeah over on uh uh so all of those so that, that you know so then i went oh there are there are sensible people out there uh who aren't, aren't all posing in front of green screens with giant alien heads behind them uh, well, uh i forgot one yeah. this, but yeah <laughs> yeah uh, although yeah. martin you've got some kick-ass graphics at the beginning of this thing i gotta say i'm gonna throw yeah. it out there i'm like you know i, the, the I aliens going i get it yeah <laughs> i gotta tell you someone sent me that like seven years ago and said hey i did this for your show and like hello like thank you uh nice. you know and that's, i never heard yeah, from them again that's nice yeah yeah you know, nobody it does just that showed up one day yeah. someone or perhaps something <laughs> Someone. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Tom, I guess I want to hear from you your interest. Well, first of all, Dave, before we move on to Tom, I yeah, just wait, Tom. You've been at you've been actually looking at this a lot longer than me. You know, and until I had my sighting in two thousand seven, I I didn't pay any attention to any of this stuff. But the thing that 
really amazed me is something that you said. I thought I was going to be looking at a bunch of nutcases when I would look into this and that like there was nothing to it. And right away I started seeing people like Stan Friedman and, you know, people that were pretty solid and thinking, wow, you know, these people are taking this seriously. And, you know, there is, yeah. I know there's something to it because I saw something weird and, you know, and now I'm seeing that other people and not just the tinfoil hatters, you know, other people that are pretty bright and sensible are taking this serious. And yeah. uh, thank goodness for, you know, the article that came out in the New York Times that really bumped it up yeah. for everybody. Yeah. You know. All right, Tom, you're on. We want to know how you got into this. I, you know, uh, have, I've talked about this on the podcast, had a weird experience when I was really young, about six or seven, where um, I recall we lived in a place called Chester Springs, Pennsylvania, which was a very remote kind of farm uh, town, uh, lots of woods, great place to grow up as a young kid. Um, and I have some experiences that were kind of paranormal, but also I recall a night where my mom and a few neighbors were on our small hill looking up over past this pasture at the sky. And they, I remember them saying repeatedly, like, what is that? What is that? And, you know, uh, uh, talking about something, I don't recall seeing it. I was rather young, but I do recall a day or two later, my mom <laughs> brought my brother and I to this field along with a few other neighbors where there was a circle in the field that was about 50 feet diameter um it appeared that the grass had been burned and even then i was i was conscious of the fact that they were saying this something had something had been there something you know and perhaps it related so i suppose at an early age i was kind of aware of of it um i would i had a profound response to whitley streber's communion uh, in high school when I read it. Uh, we just had the uh, pleasure uh, of having Whitley as a guest. And that was really, I don't know, such a strange full circle. Very cool to speak with him after, you know, 35, however many years it was that um, I had first read his book. So that really impacted me. And I'd written him a letter and all because I was a very lucid dreamer. I didn't have any abduction experiences or anything like that. But I had, I don't know, for some reason, it really resonated. And then had... Um, in college, a very dear friend who's also subsequently been a guest on the show, um, a woman named Jean Anzulis, who's just such a great friend when I was at, uh, at college, had a kind of inexplicable uh, experience that she shared, an abduction experience that had corroboration and um, really forced me to confront, as I know Dave and I have talked about a lot, you know, sometimes you... I'll believe this part and I'm not going to believe this part or I'm going to, you know, I'll sort of, uh, you know, I think I'm open to that, but this is where I draw the line. And it really forced me to confront this, this issue of like, you know, trusting a person and, and, uh, you know, and yet it forced, would then force me to confront my own belief in reality and what, you know, was possible because it was an extraordinary story. Um, so that those really were all kind of, what kind of built it in, baked it in for me. And then, um, like I said, some, you know, I would dip in and dip out, but it probably wasn't until Dave and I kind of uh, really sat down and, and I started to hear what was going on recently post 2017. And, um, and then as my, my work as a writer requires me to dive into topics quickly and try to become really, really, um, just uh, marinate in something very quickly and try to get. So I just dove in and and have really been trying to absorb as much as possible uh, in the literature and podcasts and all of that. So it's been a, it's been a ride. And these conversations we've been having have, <laughs> so there have been some nights where I'm, I'm like, this is intense. You know, this is very it's intense what I'm hearing here. Well, I'll tell you what, it keeps me going. I mean, it's 12 years now and I don't have any plan at all to stop. I'm really, I think we're in a, amazing times at this point. And we're also in times, I don't know uh, if I should go too much on this or not, but, you know, with the social media going kind of haywire with uh, a lot of crazy talk and uh, a lot of people bashing each other and threats. And, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's crazy. Lou, I heard from 
uh, Lou Elizondo's wife today. And it's just the things that people are doing is, is just unbelievable. And so, um, so mean, that's the double edged sort of you mean the social pushback. media. Yeah. The, def, yeah, def, the, the threats and things, you know, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I think definitely, I mean, I, I just finished watching, um, uh, George and Jeremy's weaponized. Oh yeah. You know, where they're yeah. talking, they were talking about the pushback, talking about things, you know, like, like Sean Kirkpatrick's sudden, you know, doing this weird, um, media tour, which is unusual for an intelligence it is. guy. It's crazy. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, and all the pushback and threats and like people like George is saying that people are, uh, you know, pressuring his, uh, KLAS to, uh, to, uh, fire him, you know, and, uh and, and, and I guess Jeremy's been getting threats and people trying to reach out to, you know, people close to Jeremy and, you know, scare them. Uh, yeah, that, that there's with and now with social with social media, uh, I think it's made the job a lot easier uh, of the, uh, you know, the pressure uh, to put pressure on people to back away. And I don't know if you follow this or all heard anything about it, but there's been some Wikipedia profile editing and yeah. that and, and then sealed off from re-editing. And that means taking accolades away from people like George Knapp and Ross Coldheart and uh, and you know, David Grush and a lot of people are affected by this and then bolstering people wow. like Ms. Mick West. And I think there is definitely a place for people like Mick West. I think he does a lot of good work. A lot of, uh, you know, he gets carried away with a lot of assumptions um, like we all can, you know, in the UFO world, but it, you know, he does help balance out when he doesn't go over the top and say something ridiculous. There are a lot of things that he does that yeah. is valuable. And well, I, I think say, we should I all look at I would say I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not, a, I've talked with Mick West and I, I think I, as a person, he think, I think he's fine. I'm not a fan of the, what he does, but uh, I'll give him this. At least he makes more of an effort than Sean Kirkpatrick. You know, right. Sean yeah. Kirkpatrick just flat out lies and doesn't, yes. doesn't support and I And I know for sure that he did lie personally, yeah. you know, from someone I know that actually uh, testified firsthand witness where beings were involved in everything. Um, that testified for four hours and 19 minutes. And he says, no, no firsthand witnesses here, you know, and, yeah. and all that. So yeah. it's kind of ridiculous. He lies and, and he provides zero uh, corroborating. Yeah. Uh, the article evidence. was, the article was such a empty tantrum. It was such a tantrum. It was such a, a kind yes. of a sour grapes. I, I also yeah. found it really, <laughs> really disingenuous and, and, uh, unbelievable that uh he's just covered all the saps he's looked in all the programs in in the maybe one year that he's been there when he didn't have a staff for about seven months of it yeah and he's you know but somehow yeah. he's managed to just dig through all of this and there's yeah. nothing to it nothing to see her moving on and it was just a well that's very, why he yeah. was so busy that's why he couldn't weak. set up an email address or uh or a uh you know, or a website or uh, anything. That's why he couldn't get anything else done because he was working so hard. I guess so. Um, I, he was just, he was covering this, every this, base. He yeah. did two whole tweets too in that year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And a LinkedIn <laughs> post. Um, no, no. And that, <laughs> no, and that, it's, it's and kind that, of that, ridiculous. That article was so insulting to Chuck yeah. Schumer and Mike Rounds, to uh, Kirsten Gillibrand right. and Marco Rubio. The Rudy, late Harry Reid. Yeah. To Tim Say they were all taken for a ride, basically. That they're all they're all in a religious uh, mania over UFOs. Yeah, and you know what the the sad part is? There's going to be so many people that read that, and they're going to take it at total face value, well, and it's a step every, back. Everyone in the media will. So yeah, I mean CNN yeah. already has. You know, you've seen that. So it's like any excuse in the media to to ignore the the issue uh, and to marginalize the people that want to talk about it. Uh, they'll they'll latch on too quickly because they just don't you know they just don't want the issue to to uh, be forced on them. Uh, but yeah, but and you know, also and also just the compl yeah the disrespect for for David Fravor and, and you know yeah. and Brian Graves and David Grush right. Um, you know, yeah. every, you know the, it, it it was despicable how how insulting that and condescending that and and dishonest. Well, he gave this passing sort of passing. Um, 
uh, appreciation for the testimony of, of pilots and then gave them no credence whatsoever in terms of the scope of the entire thing. Yeah. It was sort of like, yeah. um, well, we've listened to these, I, I, the, the takeaway was that they are not um, credible because he certainly came away from the whole thing feeling like there's no there there. It felt like a, a, yeah. a very knee jerk careerist. I don't even know if it had any sort of agenda beyond this guy kind of trying to throw a few tomatoes at people that he blamed for why he's on the outs anyway. And um, mm. it was, uh, yeah, it was, it didn't really stand up to much scrutiny and certainly didn't. Yeah. Well, know, certainly if he really vague, had, so if vague, he, if he had something to tell, then I'm sure he, he could have ex taken a moment in that op-ed to explain why the Tic Tac uh, encounter wasn't significant. You know? Well, here's the thing about that. When I, I watched a, uh, some type of conference he was involved in, you know, like a week or two before he stepped down. And he said right up on the podium and someone asked him, it was a Q and A, someone said to him, well, what about the Tic Tac incident? You know, that's, you know, what about that? And he said, you people out there on YouTube, you know all I know about that. That's all the data there is. Well, that's bullshit, you know, first of all, because yeah. The data bricks were take removed from the ship that night from the uh, from the uh, Nimitz that night from the Hawkeye with all the data from that whole situation gone. Someone flew in probably from the Air Force. That's what they think. And it yeah. requested them and left with those. That's data right there. And so yeah. you can't tell me that's all they had. Yeah. You know well, I mean? and, and even the data that that we have, the three of us have. Is plenty to 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 uh, chew on, uh, you know. Even if all you had was uh, David Fravor and Alex Dietrichs and uh, Chad Underwood's uh, eyewitness mm. accounts and the video, if that's all you had, there's, there's still all right. Explain that. Explain those eyewitnesses. Explain the the data that's front front facing in that video, you know. Well, perhaps I've given him less credit than I should, because in thinking about it, I guess there's nothing better than to just take it all and just broadly brush the entire thing away. Because if you do start to deal individually, you, you everything begins to crumble. So he probably took the best strategy he could, which is just, yeah, nah, nothing, you know, just, yeah, uh, it's all kind of uh, not real. And uh, there's nothing there when in fact, any individual case we can talk about with any of these people, Alex Dietrich, Ryan Gray's on and on and on. There's so much there to, to uh, the jellyfish, yeah. you know, that Jeremy just came out with, you know, it's, yeah. um, there's so much to unpack. There's so much unknowns. There's so much curiosity around it, so much secrecy around it, so much uh, that, you know, that uh, it's the heights of disingenuousness <laughs> for sure. Well, you can do what I don't know. If, their, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say you can do what they did in their first report. Just come out and say uh, a small percentage display flight characteristics that require further investigation. Unusual flight characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very, very um, uh, anodyne way of saying <laughs> defy the laws of physics, you know, uh, that break break our science, uh, you know. Because and no journalist at the time said, "Well, what were those unusual flight characteristics?" In which case, the answer would have been, "Oh, well, hitting Mach thirty uh, without sonic booms, doing right angle turns at five thousand miles an hour, yeah. uh, hovering stock still for hours in hurricane force winds, uh, oh, uh, being able to block our radar, um, you know, <laughs> it, uh, being able to go from you know space to." Uh, to the atmosphere and underwater yet, yeah, you know, unusual, unusual <laughs> characteristics. Yeah. And, and there's still people that are adamant that it's our technology, Yeah, you know, and there's just no way for one thing, the G force is uh, we don't have anything that would stay together. No, I not even any circuitry or anything that would stay together with that type C of G -force. certainly yeah. not human bodies. Yeah. Nothing could survive mm -hmm. on. Yeah. But yeah, no, no like, uh, I mean, what is, I think, uh, like our best jets can handle about seven G's before they fly apart or something like that. Yeah. But think uh, about this has been happening forever. People have witnessed, you know, something on radar back in the 60s going, I think it was over 10,000 miles an hour. You know, I mean, yeah. it's been going on forever. This is what, um, this thing right here is what another parting thing that Kirkpatrick did is saying, well, here you go. Here's Ryan Graves, uh, 
you know, his sphere that is going to do, it's a Chinese drone and it's going to do all these unusual maneuvers and all that. Uh, well, if you talk to, to Ryan Graves, which you did, um, these are clear spheres with a little cube inside, you know, nothing to do with that. Um, but you know, it's just, yeah. he's throwing it out there yeah, and love, throwing everyone under the bus, you yeah. know, basically. It's like, here's an idea. Well, what show us the, show us the, the video of that sphere, uh, that show us the video of that in hurricane, like, uh, level four hurricane winds sitting like this for hours you know, yeah, in category right. four level, you know, category four hurricane winds. And mm. that what they observed stood still in that nothing for hours. Um, you know, we don't know of anything that can do that. And I, I've got a funny feeling that that plastic balloon couldn't do it either. <laughs> or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. I'm going to, there's something I have to call out here. Uh, it's you, Tom, wasn't it your birthday? Like, oh, well, yes, it was a few days ago. Dave was being very sweet about it. Uh, oh, that's yes. what he was. I'm Dave 30. Was being sweet. Well, that's <laughs> you're how old? What was that? 30. Yeah, 30, 30 nice. years old. Nice. 30 mock yeah. two. <laughs> 30 Happy belated ish. birthday. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. It's yeah. very kind yeah. to be able to say Happy lovely. birthday to you. Now we're pushing it, but thank you, go. Dave. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> all we all we needed. That the, the funny thing about what you well, guys I've seen doing. Dave play guitar before. He's he can belt out a song. He knows right. what he's doing. You know, yeah. he'll, he can carry a tune. Like, <laughs> karaoke with the man. Yeah. I know what's going on here. Um I think when something someone is stung, when someone is hit and feels it, they react strongly. And I feel like that's what we see here with the social media pushback on some of these people that are just um, kind of nobly trying to bring the truth to people. Uh, when we see people like George Knapp, who has um, just with nothing but grace and a kind of egoless effort for, you know, 30 years or more to try and bring the truth out and people go after him. It's just, I, I think we have broken through to a, level that is unnerving people and um i think kirkpatrick yeah. represents that kind of energy and and um you know mm -hmm. let them go through this wave of let this let this sort of wave pass i believe this will be the story of uh the decade and and honestly who who we don't we don't know what's going just let's get let's get to the bottom of it. Let's just find yeah. out. Don't tell everybody they're idiots or don't let's just, and if let's root it out and find out what's happening. And maybe yeah. it's completely, um, if there's innocent no story, or, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. And if there's no story, why this coordinated attempts to intimidate and, and silence right. people, these freak outs, and I had, freak uh, outs and uh, threats. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had representative Tim Burchett on last week and, uh, he says, one of the things he said is, um, he was contacted by someone, um, in an upper administration that said, you know, you really kicked a hornet's nest in the Pentagon. You know that, right? And you should get some people around you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of like, like, you know, yeah. be careful. I know. And that's you where know. you got to go. Like someone like George Knapp, you know, he went after the mafia, you know, that's right. Uh, that's before right. Yeah. He, before yeah, you know, before he was on yeah. the UFO beat, he, you know, he was reporting on the mafia and he was like, he, you know, and he would see these guys face to face all the time, you know, uh, it was all so, kind of very amusing to him, which just made so, him so, he's such a great, you know, it's it's just as a uh, interesting guy, you know, his his dealings with the mob, like, yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, my friends would really like to kick him in the balls and get, you know, just write the meanest stories possible. It was almost like this goading of these. So he's clearly not afraid of anybody. And it seems like every time someone pushes him or lies to him or says something in private and then said, you know, it his reaction yeah. is anger. His reaction yeah. is he's he's mad at them, and so he keeps going and and digs in, and I think um, that's yeah. kind of what's re required. Um, it, yeah, obviously it is. It it's the secret of the millennium. Of it's the secret of all mankind. So if that is in fact what's being kept secret, and if people are getting close, and if Grush really did, uh, you know, uh, pull the curtain back on yeah. the whole thing, then. You know, that would explain some of the stress and pressure he's feeling right now. And um, which apparently is the case, you know, it's just it's it's 
it's probably not a pleasant place to be on the edge of that diving board. Um, right. You know, uh, when they say anger is the second emotion. It's usually fear, mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. you know, what brings it on, which is pretty interesting. Um, so here's a question. We're going to, I'll pop a question or two up here. Uh, this gentleman's in the, every show. Uh, what do you think ETs think about your podcast? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if they're capable of uh, tuning in. But I hope they are. I don't. Yeah. Uh, they're probably pretty busy. I'm yeah, what do they think of Fargo? I think yeah, is, there, you know, that's yeah, are they like, watching yeah. Fargo? Yeah, I think um, uh, they wrote Fargo probably. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. I don't know with those they, twists. They might be entertained by our when efforts. the Flying Saucer showed up. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I that was earlier. They, yeah, and then early Fargo. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think they, they didn't even talk about it. Yeah, in, showed up twice. Like season two or three or something. Season I two, yeah. Remember. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. wonder if they're tuned into our media. Uh, I'm not sure why they, I, my suspicion is they probably, we probably would have a very, very, very hard time communicating with them at all, right? I mean, they, they yeah. might just be um, dealing with different things if they're this advanced, you know, beyond us with, with sort of different uh, interests and uh, probably, but if they are, let's, uh, hey, let's talk, you know, we'll get you Dave's email. Yeah, and um, it's gonna make, and if they're paying attention to our podcast, it's really gonna make the folks over at SETI angry. Uh, that's all true. That work, they, they all keep, that work. They just keep ignoring those poor people. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's true. So Purposely, give, yeah. yeah. Give them uh, something. Throw them. Yeah. Throw them something. Yeah. Whistle a tune. I, I had uh, I had Seth Shostak on my show a couple of times. He's yeah. He's a senior astronomer over there, and um, you know, I mean, I I came even though he was totally closed minded. Um, as far as, you know, it's kind of, well, almost ridiculous um, because they're looking for basically the same thing. It's just that there's no way it's here. We got to have funding to look out there. You know, um, I think it's better than them doing nothing. I think it's yeah. still a good idea. Well, I, I, but I mean, who knows what type of technology could be. It, radio waves may be very primitive. Who knows? Yeah, I'm, well, I, met, I met Seth Shostak a long time ago. And I liked him a lot. And and. And yeah, also back, very in the, back in the nineties, I had all my computers had the SETI at home app running as the screensaver. So I was doing my bit, you know, to, uh, oh, wow. to, to go through the radio signals. Um, uh, you know, they were crowdsourcing all of that back in those days. Um, you know, I thought it's a great thing, but yeah, but you're right. But then the, the, the unwillingness to pay any attention to anything else. I mean, I guess it's human nature. You don't want to. I, yeah. I noticed a little bit of that with with Avi Loeb, for example, who's focusing on one. He's one aspect of this phenomenon, and he's very curious about taking his specialty and what he is, you know, such an incredible scholar in, and 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 examining rocks, interstellar rocks, and seeing if there's data there that can prove. So when you've got Grush on one side, just saying like, yeah, there's twelve ships they over here in this garage, and Avi is trying to study, you know, a rock from you know a few billion light years away. You could tell he's like. Yeah, I'm interested in that. I really sort of want to kind of focus on this. And I think this is the way to do it. It is uh, human nature, Dave, to your point. Yeah. And I think people kind of want to, you know, they want to protect their silo, um, yeah. which, uh, like, and I, who knows where the answer will come from. And very, like, Abby very well might, uh, and he already may have been um, tapped into something for sure. Yeah, he may bring us some evidence. And, but I'll be, it's like uh, when Robert Bigelow was on uh, 60 Minutes. Yeah, and uh, you know, so they asked him if he thinks, you know, do you think light there is life out there? Here. You think we'll find yeah. it? He said, "You don't have to look out there; it's here." Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I've seen it. Yeah, you know, it's right. Here. You know, it's like, you know, it's it it is that that thing of uh, so Falco. I think my dog wants to go out. Um, the uh, well, but we can want a walker. No, I'm yeah, just we gonna, can I, we can I'm handle just, it without you for a little. Take while. us, I take us with you, Dave. Him, I can just put him on the patio. I'll open the patio door. Get his water okay. wings on. So Get his water right, wings on. Right back. Well, don't forget to unplug if you have to do that. So, uh, all right. You know, I'm Avi right. Loeb though. Avi Loeb is has the curiosity of a child, even though he's a yeah. scientist, and he's pretty open. I've had him on. I don't know four or five times, and he's pretty open with the whole thing that they possibly could, you know, be here. He's not, he's not closed minded to it. No, he does not rule it out. It, it was, and he, and he was magnanimous to, to what Grush had talked about. He didn't, he was, he, he wanted, 
obviously to talk sort of what what he was up to and didn't know how to apply it. But no, I agree. He's not completely cut off to it. I just find it, you know, I think it's it's natural for someone's like, I want to find them this way, you know, and I have the expertise yeah. to to uh, find them this way. And I think his projects to sort of dredge the ocean for this evidence is fascinating um, and makes a lot of sense to me that there would be if there are advanced civilizations somewhere out there, then their trash is likely flying through, you know, the atmosphere and through other galaxies. And it could just very easily be the way we find a, um, that we're sharing this space with someone else by finding their discarded Diet Coke cans or the equivalent thereof, you know. Um, That's right. Yeah. I thought there was and a lot of And you think of it this logic. way, too. Um, okay, I just look at You think of it this way, too, that he raised for the galileo project he raised so much money and then you look at what nasa funded to do their ufo or uap research i don't know if you heard about this but it was one i don't know what they just i'm not sure what the <laughs> okay yeah, that's well. that's what they that's what they set aside to do uap yeah a research. little bit of lip service there i guess i'm not sure what yeah, yeah. that's like buying Benefits everyone in nasa lunch one time something yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the challenge. And one of the things that um, we noticed at the, the Saul Foundation thing, you know, that this, this stuff does cost money. You know, it's like people want to do satellite experiments. They want to find ways to develop cameras that can take pictures of anomalies in the sky when they occur. It's the, the issue is that nobody's looking and technology is not directed towards searching for it. And the effort, uh, as Avi's effort, it, you know, he's trying to set up multiple kind of stations at various um, campuses and at various locations to try to capture things, but it all requires uh, funding, it all requires maintenance, it all requires, and and who's going to do it? And obviously, private industry is probably who has to do it and private, you know, funding, um, because as you say, from NASA's budget, that doesn't appear to actually be the the priority. I guess they want to be in the cultural conversation, but it doesn't appear that they want to really put the money toward it. Um, I'm, I love NASA. I want them to go look at all the planets. I want them to go to Europa. I want them to send submarines into, uh, you know, space oceans. I do think that we'll find life um, through those efforts. And I, you know, but it would be nice if they could do both at the same time. Right. And I think that could happen. I just put the phone number up. Um, uh, I see Dave's coming back in in just a minute here. And so I just put the phone number up if anyone, since we're having such a casual, fine mm -hmm. conversation. And I wondered how you guys felt about going a little over the hour, like oh, sure, an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. Since so, Dave's not back in yet, we'll say he said yes. Okay. I will. Yes. I will officially back say in. Here he is. Dave I'm wants back. to go four hours. He's he back. told me. Yeah, we're doing four hours tonight. I want to do a right? full marathon. Yeah, my back's turned. You guys make plans. Yeah. Right. That's right. Dave Sorry. will have to pee way, way before four hour mark. No, because I took advantage of Falcor's peeing. Oh, uh, Dave. Also be. All yeah. right. Well, that was, I guess, smart of you. I mean, not outside. I Don't didn't. use your dog like that. We know what the real agenda was the yeah. whole time. You know, what's up, Falcor? Come here. We have a, I live in this community down in here in South Carolina, and we have a missing dog named Brody. And mm -hmm. it's been going on for a week now, and there's Brody sightings everywhere. And the owner says, do not approach him. Do not call his name. Do not make eye contact. Just tell him where you saw him. And people Jeez. are seeing him all over the place, golf courses, right. and through people's yards and everything. A whole week now. And would, everyone's maybe, like, what's Brody doing? And people are out in their golf carts and, looking for him. Why, why, I would why, run why like we, hell why, if I saw Brody I know after yeah. that morning. I was thinking maybe there. there's maybe there was cause for some sort of intervention before Brody went missing. Yeah, I, 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 it sounds like it. I Brody know. was my yeah. dog. Might have yeah. put him to giving him the boot anyway. Don't no eye contact and don't call his name. He's going to chase you down the street. Martin, you yeah. stay it's indoors one of until three, they find Brody. Three basset hounds that they have. He's a so basset yeah. hound. Oh. Basset hound. They can't catch him. So he's <laughs> he's like a. Now listen to this. The owner said he was within ten feet from me. And I turned, the owner turned, did not try to catch him. And they I would can, have tackled that dog. They can, and then yeah, someone no, wrote, they, it's on Facebook, down. you know, someone wrote, it's not a gazelle, you know. No, they can, they can hit almost five miles an hour. <laughs> Basset hound? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So now Brody's on national news. It's really going to be. 
Brody, like, yeah. Brody sounds yeah. like a monster. It sounds like a Cujo. Yeah. I'm not know, going. Like, Cujo. Who's a good boy? Yeah. You talking to me? Yeah, like <laughs> Brody, and suddenly like run, run. You know those ears flapping and coming at you. That's I always right. wanted a basset hound, actually, but my family has rejected that. So instead, we I can we understand have... they make that noise, that very the yeah. well, we got a don't bulldog they bay or something. Oh, bulldog! The yeah. bulldog yeah. is just a bizarre. We have a fourteen-year-old bulldog. I mean, she's so. Is it past an her... English bulldog? Or... Oh yeah, she's so past her expiration date. It is not even <laughs> funny. She, yeah. my God, bless her. I mean, she's hanging in, yeah. but but what a yeah. what a mess. Yeah. I mean, well, they she's... Say oh, the, wow. The, the first thought in any bulldog's uh, mind when they're born is, oh, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> no, you can see it on their face. It's just this yeah. inexplicable sorrow and kind of moodiness. Yeah. But uh, we love her. Peaches is yeah. her name. Well, and I had a um, auction gallery and uh, I used to run the New England Bulldog um, show used to be there every year. There'd be like 500 bulldogs in that place. It was really uh, it was really quite interesting. Yeah, that'll put a lot, that of methane, for several years. a lot of methane into the air with the with the, all those bulldogs in one place. That's I'll right. tell you. That's right. I had to That's paint right. the house a few times because of this. Uh, yeah, she's a, good, <laughs> she's a good girl. But OK. Oh, God. yeah. We're supposed to talk about. Uh, yeah, we're we'll back. UFOs. She is. The, Peaches yeah. is kind of an alien, though. I'm going to I'm not going to lie. She's Yeah. Yeah. So I did put the phone number up there. It's 855-472-5483. Um, yeah, we do only me, have, do you, want me to, do you want me to call in? Yeah. Call Dave. Yeah. No one's calling in. So, and I thought this, you know, just being such a casual show, but I can look to see if, uh, there's any questions, uh, that are popping up. Nothing really, but anyone's welcome to call in. Oh, here's, uh, what is this? I tell people to put their, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Another Fargo plug. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, a he friend of mine, Fargo, I, buddy. Talked to me today and said he uh, he he loved you on news radio as well. Um, yes, we so did. you can watch yeah. that on Amazon now, I believe. Oh, how about that? Yeah. All right. Dave and I did um, a pilot together years back. Remember, Dave? You were kind of the bad guy on my my pilot. We're going back twenty years. What was it? I can't it even called, remember. It was called Barnes, and was it was memorable. it was sort of like a. Hey now, Martin. It was a it was a working title. Um, <laughs> we were. It was, I guess, kind of like the um, the what's that nerd show that's gone on for a hundred thousand years? God bless them. Um, the Big Bang. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was sort of a Big Bang theory, and uh, you were a curmud curmudgeonly teacher. And I'm worried about your memory, Dave, that you don't remember yeah. that you were on this pilot. This Did was we our shoot it? first. <laughs> yeah, we shot. It. We shot it. Oh my yeah. God! We need an intervention. That's true. I've totally crazy. forgotten it. No. Oh. I'll get you the DVD. Oh so we got Tom. Uh, Tom King right here is in the chat, and uh, Tom King was one of the people at the Phoenix Lights. And I know oh, you wow. just mentioned that he is one of the people that you hear on uh, James Fox movie when he's talking about. Uh, I forget what his phrase is when he's like, "Like oh my God" or something like that. One of the people filming the Phoenix Lights. Oh, wow. That's mm. Tom King right there. Well, hi, Tom. In the chat. That's cool, Tom hey, King. Tom. Oh, I, cool. Yeah, I know. I, I love that. I love. I love the uh, uh, James Fox's follow up. The I know what I saw, which is not, what went more in depth on the on the uh, Phoenix Lights and the uh, the ridiculous explanation, and of course uh, the governor eventually coming out and admitting that he saw it too. That's uh, right, Fife Symington. Symington. Yeah, and I Come had uh, Barnett, uh, the woman that took all the calls. She was on my show at some point uh yeah. years ago so tom king does have a question for us oh sure and what do you think of all the current situation of tons of ufo news uh, well i think it's uh i i think it's an amazing time to be talking about this topic and it's one of the reasons we you know we are doing it and having conversations every week with with people that are involved with this topic and i'm sure why you're doing it martin i mean it's it feels like something is happening that's very profound that is going to um and i i think we see the pushback so it feels like from month to month it it feels like the skeptics are winning and then it feels like there's this new push of information and um i just think it's a really interesting story to look at um we, you know, we were talking with Jeremy Corbell a couple of weeks ago about the the new military footage of that jellyfish UAP. 
it just feels like we're going to be seeing more and more of this. It's going to be harder to conceal. And um, yeah, I keep kind of telling my kids, I just think it's going to be an interesting time to be alive. And then, you yeah. know, the, what we might learn in the next 10 years, maybe sooner um, about our kind of place in the universe. Yeah. And, and I think well, it's, a, the, a, to me, the thing that struck We me do have a caller. Oh, just late, no. oh, well, there you go. Oh, well. Isn't that exciting? Enough I'm sorry, me. but you can finish your thought, Dave. Well, I, I'm just saying that the pattern to me uh, seems to be anyone who honestly looks at the issue and intelligently assesses what, you know, the data that's just easily uh, accessible uh, takes this seriously. So if you don't have an agenda that requires you to not take it seriously or you just or you're just refusing to look at it, which is the majority of people. But anyone who takes the time to look at it winds up diving in mm -hmm. that's cool. exactly what happened to me because you know i could have i the funny thing is is um i was not i was doing my show on antiques and i did something on comedy as well and um then uh, a comedian interviewed me and he asked me you know what's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you and that kind of got me started because you said a lot of you know ufos a lot of people love ufos and Anyway, I think I'm going to take this call. Sure. And uh, let's see. I'm going to bring this in. And we have Lee. I believe it's Lee from Arizona. Welcome to the show, Lee. Hi, it's Leah. <laughs> Leah, Leah, I'm sorry. Leah. Hi, Leah. Hi, no welcome. Worries. Hi. Hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Very That's well. How, how are you doing, Leah? Where are you? Where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Not far from the Air Force Base here, actually. <laughs> Oh, no rain. Have you no. seen anything interesting over that Air Force Base, Leah? Um, you know what? This this uh, Air Force Base here, I have not. I do have some people um, last year that did see some things, um, but I have had it, some other experiences myself, not located oh. in the Tucson area. Um, I did move down to the Tucson area last year, and I resided just a little bit north in the Phoenix area my whole life prior to that. And I had some experiences there uh, with a witness as well. My mother was present for something that had happened. It was the summer of 2018, I believe. 18? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I, we had just both witnessed. I mean, it really is still to this day. I don't really know how to explain it because it does sound quite um, odd. Uh, but just as long story short, it was late in the evening. I was doing some work on the back patio and something told me, you know, you need to look over. And um, Leah, I, Leah I, have, I hate to do this to you, but you're going to have to really wrap it up because we only have about 20 seconds and KGRA has got to, okay. they have the phone number. <laughs> so they're going to have to bail oh, us. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Well, we had, a, we had a red, red orb just very slowly about the size of like between the largest beach ball I've ever seen and a very small mini car. Wow. I just not like very casually just floated into the backyard and it just stood there. And I screamed and I ran inside. I got my mother and I said, there's no way this thing is going to be there when I come back out. Came out. Sure enough, it was still there. And here comes the second one. And it just floated like 10, 15 feet above the ground. And there was two of them. They looked like plasma orb balls. It was weird. Wow. They were reddish. Okay. Reddish I'm, I'm sorry. We have and to say goodbye, Leah. Leah. Thank you so much. Leah, and bye, an everyone awesome over story. at KGR Radio. Yes, wish we could have talked longer. Go, Leah. Okay. She yeah, was, that's all right. In yeah, fast right. No, with a cool story great. and out. Yeah. yeah. Too bad. Thank that you. Didn't. Thank you for and sharing. I, find, uh, I don't know if you have this happen to you, but when you're out and about and the topic comes up, it happens to me a lot. And uh, that all, if you dare enough to bring up the topic, it seems like nine times out of 10, someone's going to say, oh, yeah, my uncle saw something or you know, my sister saw something or I saw something, you know, yeah. I mean, it's so prevalent. It really just, it's everywhere. Yeah. I think the thing that's happening less and less often, and I'm happy to say that is that, is that when I bring up the topic, I'm getting this a lot less once where people just go, ah, uh-huh. Uh. <laughs> you know, Wait a minute, do the eye patch at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sad. <laughs> yeah. But that's I've begun like, to, yeah, I've begun to test the, I go, 
do you really want to talk about it? And then I give them like sort of the the one minute version and I see sort of where they're at. And then uh, I'm happy to dive in more. And I my experience is people are dying to know what's going on are absolutely yeah. fascinated. And, um, and I think they, you know, people are really thirsty for information and uh, don't. And I think because of our scattered mosaic of how we get information now, you know, just it's so diff it's so individualized that, you know, we you're simply not getting the same information. And so I think when this topic comes up, there's so much that people are not aware of that is going on that has been very significant. And um, and you don't have to believe anything. Just listen to even what's in the mainstream media or what the government or laws that are being passed, laws that are being passed, I yes. think is a, is a fine place to start. By, it's like, you don't, don't take my word for enemies, it. political enemies, yeah, are yeah. finding common ground in yes. writing legislation about non-human intelligences. Yeah. 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 I mean, when I had uh Burchett's a fine example of that, when he was on last week, he was talking about um, this Democrat that, on the other side, he said, we have nothing, nothing in common at all, but we totally agree on this. And he even played Santa at my Christmas party and he's mm -hmm. Jewish. And he went, you know. Jason Moskowitz is, I'm, I'm guessing it was him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it, it, that's the thing is like, if the, if the mainstream media picked up on no other part of this story, other than the fact that the only issue that is that is getting bipartisan cooperation uh you know unanimous votes bipartisan unanimous votes for legislation um both in the uh, you know house of representatives and in the senate uh and the only issue that 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 this at this horribly divided time in our in our history is the ufo story so any yes. anything anything that has you know, if, if Mike Rounds and and uh, Chuck Schumer had their name on any other legislation, it would be front page news. Yes, you know, absolutely. Whatever, whatever, whatever the subject was, whatever it was about, yep. if it was yep. about, you know, if it was about out outlawing, um, you know, uh, macrame, uh, you know, it would be. They did that a few years ago. Yes, was, thank God. Yeah, yeah. Thank God, I lived through the seventies. It was terrifying. Um, <laughs> So uh, I love the owls. The owls were, yeah. you know, owl <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are good. Yeah. So it, yeah, anything at all that they were writing legislation about together would be front page news. But because it's UFOs, because it's non-human intelligence, uh, the the media just ignores it. You know. Did Burchette? I'm curious, Martin. Did Burchette have any um, offer any insight into the gutting of Schumer's UAP legislation? Because Dave was reminding me of that rather fascinating exchange between Senator Rounds and Schumer on the floor when they were defending the legislation. And yeah. uh, uh, again, a kind of gobsmacking <laughs> dialogue between yeah. two, uh, a bipartisan conversation about UAP and non-human intelligence. I was just curious if, because yeah, I think for was involved other, in that. My good friend. Yeah. 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 Mike well, Brown's yeah. referring to, to Chuck Schumer as my friend, uh, Senator yeah. Schumer. Yeah, that's quite, that is interesting. He mentioned something along the lines that how powerful it is and you know, the, the standing up against it and uh, the information getting out there. And uh, one of the things I listened to, uh, I really love uh, um, the podcast that uh, Ross Coldheart and uh, uh, the oh, need to know and Bryce Abel do together. Yeah. And they're, uh, you know, basically Coldheart came up with a very good point that the eminent domain may have been a step too far you know, they're not going to want to give up. And I, I do understand they may have a lot of money invested in whatever they're doing with these things, if they have them. And, uh, you know, for them to actually give that up. Uh, but just it could have been changed to um, letting, you know, give some transparency. Yes, we do have this. We've been working on it for this long. And this is the data we have, you know, that type of thing. But um but that that may have been the the stick that broke the camel's back and really pushed this thing, you know, out oh, yeah. of happening. 
Jacques Vallée oh, yeah. didn't want to give up. He hated the eminent domain part of the law, apparently. Um, he, you know, because he's been collecting pieces from crash sites for, you know, and and uh, was under the impression he was going to have to give it up. Um, huh. Yeah, and uh, was 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 pushing back. So it could have come even from this this. You know, it wasn't just from those hiding, and I think it could have been coming from advocates for transparency that that don't want to, you know, be forced to give up their stuff. Uh, yeah, I never, think never thought of that part of it or heard of that part of it. Yeah, he brought it up at the Soul Foundation. He um, was there was a the colonel whose name uh, uh, Nell. Yes. Um, oh yeah, Carl Nell, mm -hmm. who yeah. either helped. It's very, very seemed very apparent. He wrote or helped to write the legislation, um, and made an impassioned kind of statement that this this was disclosure, and this this that the Gang of Eight uh, very purposefully had their names on this legislation because they are the red in parties in Congress that have to know of this kind of um, global level important event and so he so but there was an exchange between him and Jacques Vallée <laughs> Jacques was not happy at all with the eminent domain part of it and uh, mm -hmm. they sort of agreed to do a sidebar on it or whatever but he was mad um yeah. and about that I think they, the um they settled it with a knife fight later yeah um, <laughs> yeah Jacques does he have to a wear knife. a patch now they all yeah <laughs> but they both had to go do 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 <laughs> I, I do have a Fargo question that came in on my personal chat from Kate. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and I know you had nothing to do with season two, but no, but I watched them. I watched. You it. did watch them, of course. And I worked. I worked with Kirsten. And that you wanted to know: was there any? What was the sense of the uh, UFOs in season two? I, I mean, if they really didn't play much. They just showed up, and you they, know, there was a beam had, and all that. Yeah, but they uh, they affected the narrative though, because it was the UFO that, that caused uh, uh, Kirsten Dunst's character to go a, go astray. I guess you know, because uh, she was like seeing the UFO, and then she hit the uh, uh, what's Culkin, right? She ran over Culkin. Uh, what's his? Name? I forget his name. Rory Culkin, or the one from Succession. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. But I mean, it was so funny. Her line in that was. Oh, that's just a flying saucer. Come on. You know, that's what yes. she says. In that. Yeah. yeah. And then later when they're having the big shootout at the motel, uh, yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're all ki killing each other. And the flying saucer comes over and it stops the action for a while. That's you know, right. Yeah. And interrupts yeah. The action. So the flying saucer makes two, two appearances that, that do affect the narrative. Uh, but yeah. I, you know, it's weird. I never asked Noah about that. I really should have. I'll have to yeah. next time I see him. Next time I see him, I'll ask him. Text him right yeah. now, Dave, on air. <laughs> yeah, All right. I mean, yeah, we have to do this live. Give him a buzz. Yeah. 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 And show us his number so we can so everybody <laughs> yeah. at home can text him too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh so a grassroots effort. So uh this okay. is a question uh yeah. from Duckhead. He wanted to know uh any thoughts on the jellyfish fish footage. And you know, there's I, yeah. there's some people that claim that they basically know what it is and um, and you know, uh, you know, this, there is a similarity to this here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. It was a weird thing. Um, well, it but seems like I don't think you can pretty easy to doctor up something like that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I, I, I think really what I personally think that, uh, we need to see the footage that the other claims were made of. And that is that it's going in and in the water. It's down there 17 minutes and then shoots out, yeah. you know? It it would be so much better if we had more footage yeah. than just you know whatever the the rumors it, are. Yeah, but, but whatever. But what we did see is pretty remarkable. I mean, and, and I have to and I have to admit, I I saw that footage about three years ago. Jeremy showed that to me, and so oh, I've I've been yeah. I for I for for about three years. One of my constant questions to Jeremy is when when's the Jer when are the jellyfish coming out? When are you? Oh. Um, and you called it jellyfish back then, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my All right, Dave. Now you had a sighting with Jeremy, right? I'm going to put did, you on yeah. the spot. I'm going to yeah, put you on the spot, few, Dave. Yeah, so. a few years ago. Yeah, we Jeremy and I saw uh, we saw a UFO together after, and neither of us had ever seen one before, and it was sort of um, yeah, at night we were we were just out walk, walking Jeremy's dog and on a road in the middle of a bunch of orange groves, and uh, 
And I said, oh, this would be a great night to see something. And then a few minutes later, Jeremy goes, turn around, Dave. And we saw this orange sort of uh, uh, rounded triangular craft, uh, glowing orange, gold orange thing. And it circled the valley that we were in, got right in front of us, hung there for a minute, and then uh, then disappeared behind the mountains. So we had it was a long, it was a lengthy um, sighting. Um, and you know, camera? Did you have your camera? No. We neither one of us. We did, but neither one of us took a picture. In fact, at one point during, we neither of us spoke for the whole thing. Um, except Jeremy at one point said out loud, "I'm not even going to take a picture." Uh, you know, um, well, did you, in, I, I would think, and it, it happened to me when I had my sighting that if I had a camera next to me, I didn't want to lose eye contact with, I mean, I didn't want to move my eyes. Yeah. It didn't even, and, uh, yeah, it is. I, but why I, would Jeremy say I'm not even going to take a picture? I don't understand that. Because I, it's, well, it's, as near as I can figure it, um, and understand this, this, this lasted for a few minutes, this whole sighting, several minutes. And, uh, and if you know, Jeremy, uh, I I've known Jeremy for, you know, several years now, and that was the longest period of time Jeremy has ever gone without speaking <laughs> in my knowledge of Jeremy. And, uh, and also I know that Jeremy like practices getting his phone out fast in case he ever sees something. So I, I don't think he said that to me, you know, uh, I don't yeah. think that was for my, I think that was, I think there was a struggle in Jeremy and that was the response and not to me. I think it was to the thing we were looking at. Uh, hmm. cause I think, uh, the fact that neither of us got emotional or excited or, or in any, or made any, we didn't talk, we didn't make a sound. We didn't, we both just stood silently for this entire event, uh, to me, it seems like the thing we were looking at was totally in control of how we were responding. It wasn't wasn't up to us. Um, uh, you know, I've had other people say things like that, and even someone that's a long time, you know, uh, UFO researcher, uh, had a situation where he felt as though this thing was actually, you know, I mean, it sounds not. I don't want to say narcissistic, but he felt that this thing in the sky was aware of him. And yeah, you know, he just he had that feeling, and it was a really strong feeling. This was yeah. Th the thing we saw was a display for us. It was you know it was requested. You know, I said we I'd like to see something. <laughs> it showed up, and yeah. again, it, it's it traveled. You know, you know, many tens of miles, like probably like sixty miles in an arc around us, and 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 got to where it was right in front of us and hung there. So wow. it, you know, so it traveled at, at distance yeah, and just stopped right in front of us, hung there in kind of three quarter profile so that we could see as much detail as possible and, uh, and hung there long enough for us to absorb, you know, every aspect of it. Did you and see Bob away. Lazar piloting it or no, 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 no. Oh. no. Uh, so, uh, and I don't want to get into that, but, um, so you, Describe this. What time of day or night was this? It was nighttime. It was, but it was winter, so it was probably. I think it was probably about seven o'clock at night. I think. And would you say when you say gold, what do you mean by that? An orangey gold glow, and it would pulsing, pulsing with light. Uh, and on yeah. the front of it, on the front of it, were three uh, white lights uh, that also were pulsing uh, as, it, mm. as it moved. Um, and what it, what it, what about a sound? No sound, uh, nothing, yeah. no sound at all. Um, completely silent. It blocked out the stars behind it. Um, wow, this this sounds like such a great, a great sighting. And yeah. I have to tell you, um, I before I was even looking into the topic at all, when I had my sighting, um, the most eerie part of the whole situation was the no sound thing. I mean, yeah. that like I couldn't understand how that could happen and why I didn't hear anything. Yeah. Well, I, I had dinner with Lou Elizondo over a year ago, I guess now like long. And I had, um, uh, with Chrissy Newton and Lou and, uh, it was, uh, and I showed him the drawing that I had done of it. And, and Lou said, Oh yeah, we were, we were looking at something exactly like that. We've seen that. 
So uh, that's one yeah. of the things I find fascinating about the jellyfish and why I don't think, you know, I don't think it, for a number of reasons it should be dismissed too quickly at all. Because on the one hand, just um, it appears that there is a much more higher resolution image, uh, according to Jeremy, that, that shows the texture of this thing, makes it, you know, very, very, very clear. It's not a collection of balloons or whatnot. But um, apparently what we're seeing is something that was probably taken on from, a, you know, taking a picture of something on a screen in a space that uh, was then apparently confiscated by everyone. But it was the fact that uh, the historical morphology of this thing is um, pretty well documented. So it's not that this is the first time a jellyfish-like object has been seen. I guess some were seen yeah. over nuclear test sites that it's kind of yeah, it's, it's in the it's in the 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 vast array of cast of characters that that we have in, of things appearing in the sky. Leah's red orbs, Dave's you know uh, kind of golden you know half bus thing, and 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 the jellyfish. Like I think yeah. they uh, they're in they're well, in the John, history John books. Keel's, John's Keel Keel's book Trojan Horse talks about the jellyfish craft. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, well, and, no, I remember. Years ago, when I was first looking into this about, they thought maybe there was a biological type of UFO that was kind of like a jellyfish in the upper atmosphere. Uh, I don't know. I, I hadn't heard much about, about it since yeah. then. Well, I think especially in light of the fact that we just had an incident uh, over um, an American military base um, in Jordan where a, a, a drone uh, got in the air, you know, and, and, blew up and killed three soldiers. Uh, so, and you have to understand that there's, they have a lot of security and the thing that captured the jellyfish is, you know, a semi dirigible uh, camera platform that is above a base, you know, our foreign base, the way that one is, was in Iraq, the one with the jellyfish. Um, because they're on guard against um, this exact drone attacks, freaking yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. And one got one got through the through the through the defenses in uh, in Jordan, and but this one, the jellyfish. Part of what's interesting when you watch the video of it is not only is it traveling over through uh, basically a base within a base, the most secure part of the base in Iraq, which is an active you know uh, conflict zone. Um, but the camera platform that's trying to capture it, if you look at it, you, you see the crosshairs, uh, it can't lock on. They are unable to lock on to this thing for the entire, that whole clip. If it was yeah. balloons. If it were balloons or if it, yeah. If, if it, was, it was anything. They but, would, but what is it? Onto it. I, I don't know how the lock on works. Does it have to have a metallic structure though? It can, I mean, no, it can, it can anything, well, anything that, anything that returns a radar signal, uh, it can lock onto. Uh, which is basically anything that's physical, you know, any, any physical object, uh, should, return. I didn't realize that's, I didn't realize that's how that worked. Yeah. It should return the signal. And, and again, these is, you know, these are really sophisticated tools. Um, but, and they were very close range to this thing. Like, like, uh, I mean, Jerry was saying that the people that operate the system that he talked to said that they can, you know, at, at 20 miles, they can lock onto a tire of an of an automobile and and Jeez. launch a missile you know crazy and hit it so yeah. here they are they're probably less than 100 feet from this thing and they can't lock onto it yeah that's that's a really significant uh detail that people keep ignoring huh uh, yeah i haven't given and it's, that it's, much thought yeah, yeah. And it's staring right in the face every time you look at that video is that that the crosshairs aren't you know right the object yeah. keeps drifting through the frame they can't lock on Right. Now, this question below, I know that you two uh, went to the Seoul Foundation, and if I had only heard about it ahead of time, I would have been there. And I, I wrote uh, Gary uh, Nolan that I'd really like to attend next year, so when they have it then. But that everyone that I talked to that went there loved it. Um, so this question is, what do you think of the Seoul Foundation, and do you think it's part of the 25-year disclosure plan? Um. Well, at first it was fantastic. I mean, I think Tom and I, like we we're, uh, you know, I was, I was starstruck by all of the, uh, you know, oh, yeah. the, the yeah. giants of the UFO uh, world that were there. Um, 
I don't know if it's part of the 25 year disclosure plan. I know Carl Nell outlined his, his, his version of the disclosure plan, uh, at, at, at the, uh, the foundation, uh, symposium. Um, but no, I don't think it's an official part of it. I think, uh, I don't know if there is an official plan. I yeah. think I think Carnell's hope. Uh, I think Nell is really hoping that he can implement one, and being there and discussing it was part of his plan to get one implemented. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. Yeah, we were blown away by the kind of yes, the sort of luminaries and just the 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 tone of it was um, kind of sobering. I would say the whole thing was sort of sobering for me it yeah. it was uh the discussion was almost felt almost exclusively about how we will as a society absorb this and how as we as a society will 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 uh o overcome the the shock of it and then a lot of discussion about should we disclose should there be disclosure um we had an interaction with chris mellon who was his whole point of his speech was going to be was going to be should we tell people uh the you know and then this term catastrophic disclosure was being thrown around a lot that maybe hmm. china or russia or somebody drags out a ship and we're forced to be back on our heels as a society and explain everything which i think was carl nell's point of like this uap schumer legislation he said um if you he again he defined the gang of eight he defined what the purpose is he's defined that they are there to work hand in hand with the executive branch on issues that are uh global and intelligence related and there is a reason that they signed on to this legislation and he laid out that it was a 10 year disclosure plan or a seven to 10 year disclosure plan. Um, so I guess it was just this, this is, it was the presumption and the assumption, it was just this ongoing awareness that we are yeah. like, it, it's all in the rear view mirror. Are they, could they be? Yeah, there was no discussion of, is it real? No, it was, yeah. it was, it was, that, there, that was not a discussion. It was all about how how do we deal with this impending reality? A lot of serious folks talking about religion and talking about the economy and talking about and you just kind of go like, what? I'm, wow, I'm in the future. This is this is a um, interesting to hear this and really gave you a lot to think about and chew on. But I I would say it was uh, important. I would say they should continue it 100 um, percent. I think it was valuable and I think, you know, it will slow, you know, it will soak into the culture hopefully and, and forget the government, you know, let, let academics, let, let uh, every regular people, let podcasters, let people that are, that are just interested, let that be the disclosure, because I think it's underway, no matter how you slice it, no matter how much they try to use old tricks um, to mm. kind of cover it, it's underway and it felt very much underway being there of like wow okay um yeah we should you know consider what this will mean and nobody had any real solutions of what what who or yeah. what they are except that it will probably be pretty jarring to us um whatever the reality is yeah i think right. that's the one thing that where my my skepticism holds is i'm skeptical of anyone who says they understand what's going on absolutely they, that they know what's going yeah. on anyone anyone you gotta run people, from those people. Yeah. yeah. All the you know, the people who say, here's here's what's here's the deal. Uh yeah. that's how you know you're you're talking to a liar, um, <laughs> or a crazy person, one or the yeah. other. Um, or both. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I know in and uh I like the uh I, I remember having a conversation in line with Jacques Vallée in um Phoenix a number of years ago and and um I said something like, you know, along the lines where, what if it is something we don't even understand? He said, oh, you read one of my books. <laughs> and I said, uh, sorry to say, no, I didn't read that. Um, it's just a thought of mine. And he says, yeah, you know, and that very well could be. And, you know, I mean, so that it, it is fascinating. And, you know, maybe it is something that we can't understand. And, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about interdimensional it would answer some of the um, experiences that people are claiming may even be an answer for ghosts. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but it's, I don't think it's the answer for everything. Well, that's know. the thing. I know we, uh, 
talking with George, uh, that James Lekatsky basically has come to the conclusion that it's all one thing. I mean, not, mm -hmm. not that there's one explanation for it, but all of these phenomena, uh, ghosts, you know, poltergeists, uh, cryptids, UFOs, that it's all part of one, one, it's all part of one thing. It's all some, it's all interconnected. It's all related. And, uh, and it's all much, much weirder than just flying saucers. Didn't I tell my poltergeist story on your show? I think I did. Yes. You might Indeed. have. Remind us. I think I did. It was, I was cleaning out uh, in the auction business, cleaning out a house and all these oh, weird yes. things happen. Yes. You know what? I'm going to post the have show. I did on your with, show? I'm going to post the show I did with you guys on my show in the show notes. So okay. people yeah. can, can yeah, watch it. It's a great story. Yeah, I had a, it was I, crazy. Speaking yeah, I'm, it, speaking I'm to close the patio door for a second because I'm. We waiting. know what you're All doing, right. Dave. Don't and quit then giving us these excuses. Yeah. yeah, we know what's yeah. happening. All right, get a um, catheter next time. Happens yeah. to me all the time. I'll take this opportunity to tell. I don't know if I, uh, if we talked about it, Martin, on our sh our show with you. I've mentioned it early on in the podcast, but just to just in terms of the gray area of where all of this exists, I had an experience um, uh, when I was probably about 21. Uh, was living b by myself for the first time um, uh, and not having a roommate or whatever, had my own kind of studio apartment in LA in a, in a building that all I will say is the, the energy in this place was so weird, you know, that you would go like, this is something's up with this place. Uh, I'm not an empath. I'm not a, I'm not an feeler of, of whatever vibe, but anyone that walked through this place was like, oh yeah, something's wrong with this building in any event. Um, I was having, I had a dream and it's kind of a funny dream because it was, uh, well, first of all, it was a lovely dream. I'm, I'm, I am now uh, a little bit more context prior to this. I was reading, I was reading some Carlos Castaneda. I was reading, you know, and he's all about kind of like there's dream forms and there's sort of things you can, you know, uh, that, that, that exist in our dreams and create, and he, he really kind of touches and nudges on this interdimensional stuff as himself as an author. So I was had a dream, um, and I think in it, I'm I don't know. I was like friends with a, a, a hanging out with Tom Hanks or something like that, and it was beautiful. It was fun, and we're like it was all it was like a silly dream. But somewhere in the dream, I I suddenly became aware that I was being observed, and not you know not probably atypical for a weird a dream that goes weird you know or something but i i began to feel like well that that everything about the dream had been a little orchestrated for my behalf so that bothered me so i think in the dream i kind of i woke up so i woke up and um i was on a, a sort of futon bed and there was a doorway in front of me and in the doorway was a human sized shadow in the doorway that was different from the shadow of the doorway. It was clearly sort of visible. And of course I had just woken up. So I, you know, was like, okay, that's unpleasant. Let me, let me close my eyes and wake up again. So I closed my eyes. I sort of shook it off. I woke up again and it was still standing there. And hmm. I, I again went, all right, now this is unpleasant. I'm going to close my eyes again, convince myself I am now fully awake, whatever. And I'm going to, and I sat up and it was still standing there uh, about, mm, I'm going to say about six feet away from me in this doorway about my size, but a full size shadow form would now, I would now describe it as we've kind of heard in the literature. I hadn't ever really read about it before. I probably had in some of these Carlos Castaneda books, or at least he had described certain things. I don't know if he had talked about shadow forms, but uh, it went away after about a minute and a half. And um, I don't, I, at the time I thought of it as sort of a haunting, um, or, mm. and yet I, I, I don't know how to describe what it was, except it lines up now with a lot of stuff I read about. Um, and, and I'm kind of, you know, I'm a real hypocrite because I can also be very dubious of other people's claims and this kind of thing, but I'm, but I'm also, you know, um, very certain of what I saw and experienced and, and I don't know whether to call it a haunting. I don't know if it was a UAP sighting. I don't know what it was, but it was very different and it felt somehow connected to that observational feeling in my dream and that I don't have any mm. 
further explanation for, except um, it was super weird, and I'm glad it didn't get weirder or, or any spookier than that. I uh, had my wife was my girlfriend at the time, and I made sure that I was not alone too much more in that apartment, or that I didn't mm. have to sleep there alone. But um, did you ever telling, see anything again, or I never there? saw I never saw anything uh, that was a shadow form again yeah. that I could, that I would describe as I don't want to, it's, there's such a creepy aspect of like, yeah. for example, Skinwalker and Hitchhikers. It made me think about Hitchhikers. And I was trying to wonder like, did I somehow pick something up or was it just the weird energy of this building? I would, Dave, I was talking about that weird kind of shadow form thingy. I yeah. feel, felt like I pulled out of my dream or something and it wouldn't go away. And, and that I didn't know if it was a haunting or a, or if it was UAP related, but it, like like we've talked about these phenomenon just they mix and match you know they yeah what, yeah what do they represent or is it just all kind of a membrane um that we can't perceive yeah that there's that's there's, right that there's that there's something about the, the the true nature of of reality that is connected to all of these events yeah that we don't understand little, the very little little that we know and uh, should we tell him, Tom, that we agreed to six hours when he was gone? I yeah, Dave, we're going to go the full yes. night. Martin's right. never done an all nighter. <laughs> it's a marathon. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. We thought we could, Jerry Lewis marathon. Is, Char we could is race Charlie Callis going to come out and do a trip? <laughs> <trick? laughs> <We're, we're laughs> no, but you're going to sing later. Apparently, the, all right. Yeah, yeah. 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 we're yeah. excited for that. That's um, coming up in three and a half hours. Yes, yeah. singing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but uh, when we run out of any time, Martin, we'll do an all nighter with you. No, we'll. We'll we'll talk for another uh, little bit, fifteen minutes, if that works for you guys. Sure. sure. Uh, so uh, I'm not familiar with this uh, MH370 orb video. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I think I'm familiar with it, but I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I don't it, either. It's the is it worth taking a look. This is the this is this yeah the, it's the uh, it's the footage of. Uh, oh oh that, that. okay the, uh, I. That's pretty well been debunked. The airline um, that disappeared. And yeah. The that showed. And, and yeah. actually, that's one thing that Mick West did a pretty good job on. And I'm believe me, I'm not sticking up for Mick West. I don't want to get a lot of hate mail. Mm -hmm. But he, he really Dave's pulled. Dave's going to send you some hate mail. <laughs> Again, he pulled that uh, cloud out that's in that video is something that you can buy as a cloud. And it matches up perfectly. Yeah. So, I mean, just that alone. That was you know, my that, impression. I don't know what to believe when I see stuff. You know what I mean? I, it's you can't so believe anything hard. today. It, it's impossible no, to know. It but looked what's really worse, compelling and what, interesting. And yeah. I, I I, heard what you heard or Martin or saw that there had been a fairly uh, elaborate description of why it was not real. I yeah. think that mystery remains a very compelling, yeah. inscrutable mystery of what happened yeah. to that plane. Yeah, and I think it, yeah, the that video I remember looking at it is going it to me it fell into that category of too good to be true kind of like yeah, and know. I believe that they found parts that they actually had the serial numbers line up or something. Yeah, on well, that. Was, maybe well, I'm wrong was, with that. Well, Netflix but, had that documentary about it. Yeah, uh, recently, that's right. But, yes, I saw that. Yeah. But I guess in the end, there uh, at the end of that documentary, there the idea was that it was still pretty inconclusive. I don't know. Still, that still yeah, that, no one's really nailed down was, what happened or where it did, where it went down. Here's another question here. 70 years oh, yeah. of no progress. Should there be a conference on reevaluating re ufological method or methods? Um, um, no. I don't know if question. there's there is any real methods. You know, it's it's all yeah. um, you know, I think what's happening, I've seen, I mean, you I'll take your opinions too, but I, I see a lot of people trying to look at this in scientific ways, you know, like the Galileo project and there's uh, the UFO talk that uh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, I can't, uh, Trumbull, uh, Trumbull and uh, Mark D'Antonio, they were trying to put that together. My friend, my friend Chris O'Brien's trying to get something. Peter Davenport has an idea. All these people have like these scientific ideas yeah, and uh, I think that's the way to go if we can get the data. And eventually. we're definitely living in a time where the technology is is, I guess, catching up to the uh, to the need, to the to the task. I mean, you do have, yeah, as you said, project the uh, Galileo project. You also have UAPX. Uh, UAPX, yes. Yeah, yeah. with uh, I think Kevin Knuth is still involved with that. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I. I 
I take some issue with the 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 premise of the question, which I I think there's quite a lot of progress being made. I, I, we have not had the press conference in front of the disc. Correct. I agree. We are all waiting, and I'm waiting, and for that moment of when we have a hands-on experience with another worldly object. Having said that, um, I think between some of these conferences, I think between the sort of groundswell of interest, I think the interest of Congress and the pushback of the executive branch, I think we are seeing a kind of watershed moment starting with 2017. And, and I think this decade will be um, seismic in terms of what what we learn and you know i could be wrong maybe it all gets swept under the rug again and we go through another you know but i i guess i would want to be more encouraging to the the person who asked the question because i do think um we we have seen movement on this um you know the book nap i i think i have it here you know the the initial assessment i mean i mean this like inside the u.s government's covert program initial revelations i mean it, this is published by the pentagon and you know, and part hmm. of this, I'm it's, familiar with that. Part of this yeah. is yes, this, it's, there's this is the second book, but with with Kyla Katsky and, and Colin Kelleher and George Knapp. And if you oh, go oh, that one, okay, I know that one. Yeah, based yeah. on the uh, the OSAP uh, program. Um, hmm. I think there is a lot of information coming out. So you know, I I I remain on a day to day basis. It's easy to get discouraged, yeah. but in the macro, I'm pretty encouraged by what's been happening and yeah maybe what's we'll in, all be made in, fools of at some point yeah. but i i think the trend is toward transparency and the trend is towards more knowledge and it seems like the government at least parts of it are strongly waking up to it and yeah. that's the pushback we're seeing it seems to be the, between the executive and the congressional um you yeah. know the legislative branch over this issue and we have and you have you have james lukatsky who's a very highly ranked you know intelligence officer and yeah. a physicist uh, who in, in that book and, you know, has come out publicly and said, we firsthand, we had a, uh, a craft, we had an intact craft and we breached the hull. Right. You know, that's, yeah, that, I, I heard that. Yeah. That, I heard that interview when that, I mean, that's uh, a pretty, it was George Knapp thing. interviewed him, right? Yeah. George and Jeremy. Yeah. Jeremy. Uh, yeah. Weaponized. But it's also, it's in the book too. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it, it's very, it, the so words are the parsed. The words are parsed almost hilariously to not even like they don't even quite form sentences. The Defense Department has so parsed what they say, uh, what, they're, what allowed, they're allowed to say, yeah. and yet what they were allowed to say, I think, is fairly uh, groundbreaking and uh, significant. Yeah, well, I think I, th I think uh, James Lukatsky would certainly be a firsthand witness, uh, credible firsthand witness. He'd be one of those people that apparently uh, Sean Kirkpatrick. Uh, 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 said, uh, you know, you know, was, has, it should be suspect. Uh, but there's a guy who high ranked, great, great, uh, history, great, uh, CV. Uh, and he says flat out, we had one, we got inside it. So yeah. what would that know, be like? You what know, do you I do? Mean, yeah. So where's Jake, yeah. where's Kirkpatrick on that? Why, you know, right. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but people have described this many times that claim they've actually been in one of these crafts in one way, abduction or whatever, or uh, an experience or whatever you want to call them. But they say uh, you hear this over and over again, that it looks like one shape, one size in the out outside and you get on the in inside and it's like huge, which uh, yeah. Yeah, it's is the, just, the TARDIS. just adds to the mystery. <laughs> Yeah, it's bigger on the inside. Yeah, so that That's Harry Potter mystery. tent, right? Uh, the, yeah, you know, the, uh, yeah, that Travis Walton story is pretty. Yeah, incredible uh, the way he describes it. Um, right, I think he comes Pink out. He and he sees all these uh, other crafts, or he's like on a mothership or something. When he comes out from those, the people that look like humans that were wearing a mask, and um, so I, I asked him. It's funny when I had him on the show many times, but he was. The first time I had him on, I said, well, you were gone four days. Where did you go to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, the questions like that. Or, uh, and he, I said, I would did have you an answer. <laughs> yes. You, you, your dog would have an answer, obviously. Yeah, yeah I would. Yeah. yeah. One thing, wherever I go, I know where all the bathrooms are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, also I, I asked him, you know, about 
odors. Do you remember any odors? You know, that's just another thing. You think of all your senses. But one of the things I thought that he said I thought was very interesting is that it was really hard for him to breathe. It was yeah. hard to get, you know, air in, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know. He's one of the people I believe, you know. Maybe yeah. maybe I'm wrong by believing him, but uh, I've sat face to face with him a number of times. And I don't feel, I don't feel like it's bull. Well, you know, some people do say it is, but you know, I don't, I don't have that feeling. And yeah, um, yeah they, he and he and his, you know, his associates from, you know, they, they seem, they seem pretty genuine, you know? Yeah. It's and, the challenge, uh, you, know, of, you, have, you know, it's the challenge of the yeah. experiencer uh, that, you know, my, my, like I said, my friend Gene was visited on uh, uh, several times in one night, had another experience years later. And, um, the, it was uh, it, it was a real process um, talking to her about going public with this because she had never shared it publicly. She had never written a book. She wasn't a UFO person. She didn't watch the movies. She actually found the movies quite terrifying to watch. Um, she's never really slept before four a.m. Uh, in the in the ensuing years and decades since this experience when she was fifteen. Oh. I, I mean, the idea that. People are like, oh, they're just in it for the money. It's like, first of all, what what money? And yeah, second yeah. of all, you know, it's it's like the the it's it's hard to come forward, my God, with something like that. Cause we were talking about it during the interview, which is, you know, not only is there an aspect of assault, which people are 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 already quite um uh, naturally unwilling to discuss or, or afraid to discuss or afraid to disclose because of the shame and the, but then you're talking about assault on a level of something that is uh, paranormal or, or supernatural or something that's like, it's just, that's a, that's a, just an incredibly double, uh, doubly difficult thing to, to, to want to admit. So I, I certainly yeah. think anybody who think people just want attention. I mean, my God, I mean, she didn't really want the attention and um, you know, it yeah. was, we were friends and she knew I was doing this thing and she was like, you know what, after all this time, maybe it will, it will make me feel yeah. good to, just talk about it and just share it because she says, I think about it every single day of my life. It, it, I'm, it's, I do my job. I raise my kids. I, I'm, you know, a successful person in the world, but it's just something that haunts her. And I think, um, yeah. And, and, and yet that is a very difficult thing to, you know, put in a government memo, right? It's, it's something that's very difficult yeah. to, it's such a one-to-one -one or private thing. And, um, and yet it's the most compelling aspect almost of this entire phenomenon to me. You know, it's yes, it's amazing and, to see things in the sky and hear p pilots talk about what they've seen. But keeping it and keeping a secret yeah. is its own kind of trauma. Yes. Yeah. And, well, I can't and, imagine if that was happening. I can't imagine yeah. what it would be like. And then I don't know how then, I could function. And then, and then that feeling that you can't talk about it because you'll be mocked, that you'll be ridiculed, yeah. you'll be you'll be you'll be dismissed. You maybe you, maybe you'll lose your job if you talk about it, you know? Yes. Yeah. Cause they're yeah, all absolutely. real, real considerations when you've had an experience like that. And there's still the, yeah, there's no upside to, there's no right. like taking and, uh, the UFO abduction. There's no upside to it. Yeah. There's no glory. I don't it. have a picture of, of him, but I have a picture of a rendition of the craft that he stumbled on in Peru in 1997. But Jonathan Wagan, um, who was on this show only the second time he's ever talked about it oh, two right. times that story yes. uh, once. fascinating uh, yeah that particular case really sells me because here's a guy that does not want to talk about it as a matter of fact he when I <laughs> it was so funny because I wasn't prepared for him not wanting to talk you know when mm. you do an interview with someone um, so right off the bat I said you know with uh, David Rush coming out and you know, this is the time to talk about this, right? And that's why you're talking about it. He looked right at me and he says, no, I'm only doing this because you wanted me to. And then yeah. I realized through the whole thing that he was in total trauma. Uh, you know, he, he said to me, move the lights back. And then I realized he felt like he was getting interrogated. And then I was with Donna um, and he he really liked her. And he said, why didn't why didn't she interview me? You know, I, you know, like <laughs> mm -hmm. here I am a guy interviewing him and he felt like he was being interrogated. And so it's, it's trauma. And why would someone be faking it in a situation like that? That's to me, it's a lot of, you know, credence right there that 
someone has all this trauma, they're willing to talk about it, but they don't want to, and you can tell it's painful for them to talk about it. Yeah, I was happy that, like, for example, with my, with Jean, um, you know, she felt really good after. You know, she felt like that was really yeah. sort of cathartic. Um, yes. And uh, you know, and so I was I was happy it didn't kind of re-traumatize her to talk about it. But yeah. it's it was just very hard for me to fathom that um, she would go to all that work and effort to to make it just it it doesn't match up with reality. And and we have to uh, we have to make peace with our choices and thoughts on this um i'm at peace knowing something happened to her and yeah. you know i can certainly kind of live with that reality i don't know what it means i don't you know um yeah and I the know. response to it was certainly a number of people responded saying you know that it made them feel better because they'd had similar experiences that they'd never talked right. about that's why the experiences group at any of these conferences is very uh you know, it's kind of like group therapy, a lot of, uh, and I've been there, I've watched them. And, you know, a lot of them are, it's a traumatic situation. And I don't get what they would get out of it. Uh, just by making things up. It's very, very interesting. My friend, uh, Dean Alioto, who you know, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's got a film coming out on that. Um, I think uh, I know where I'm keeping you guys, I am taking advantage of you, keeping you a little long. But um, I'm going to pull up some of the questions. Let's see if we can answer sure. some of these. Uh, Andrew wants to know, um, he asks myself, and have you, Dave and Tom, watched the Professor Simon Holland, where he claims to have questioned a former head of Pan-European Radio Telescope about a mechanical first contact signal received in 2019. I'm not aware of this. Neither am I. Neither am I. That sounds Interesting though, it really it Andrew should be on here instead of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Andrew I, knows, his, yeah. knows his shit. Excuse yeah, too, my language. Too bad. That's all right. <laughs> hey, Andrew, if you're still there, I know it took a little while for me to put this up, but if you're still in chat, please uh, try to link something in the chat down below, and I'll make sure that gets into the uh, show notes, so at least we can look at it. You know, after. I mean, I do know that James Webb Telescope found some uh, interesting. Uh, chemicals in the atmosphere of a planet that's uh, fairly nearby in light years. I think a few, maybe a hundred or thousand light years away that I think it's 137 uh, light years away. Is it? Uh, so it's like down the, right down the block, day. as close yeah. as you are to me, Dave, on, yes. in Studio a, a planet, City. Um, one and a half times the size of Earth, I guess. But had, uh, but had molecules or in something in the atmosphere that seems to be very indicative at early stages of life. Life could only yeah. be the chemical contributor to what's in the oh, atmosphere yes. of this I planet. Believe, yeah. I believe they found patchouli. No, <laughs> that's hope, where that I went. I hope not. I I'm, hope not. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad that went to that planet. Yeah. Yeah. Instead yeah, exactly. Of Let's get rid yeah. of it here. But um, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, I do think the I'm a, I love space travel. I'm all for, you know, if billionaires want to spend all their money on going to space, cool. Like let's find, let's go. I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't, I think there's plenty to go around. We can feed people on earth and still send spaceships and learn about what's nearby because I think, uh, we have some really exciting candidates for life. Very, very close by, you know, reachable in our lifetimes, you know, explorable in our lifetimes and, and moons that, um, have warm oceans, you know, underneath all that ice that we could, uh, we could, we could find all kinds of stuff. We may not, we may not, you know, we may not find the grays, but um, I, I think that kind of exploration is critical. I do too. I think it would be, and I do think I, I did have an astronomer, an astrophysicist that was on this show, Adam, hmm, I can't think of his last name, but uh, he is, in a program and they're developing ways to look for using the James Webb, which is very valuable time. Uh, he is looking at ways to detect, you know, what would signals look like? He's they're writing papers on it right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, and, and until very recently, uh, scientists like, I mean, even Avi, Avi Loeb talked about people that would propose like when Avi Loeb proposed, uh, you know, if we've got these telescopes and we've got these sensors, let's let let's look for pollution. Let's look yeah. for industrial waste in yeah. the atmospheres of these planets. Yeah. And and uh, that notion was being shot down by academia. They're going, no, no, that's ridiculous. That's you're talking UFO crazy talk. 
And uh, yeah. but it's like, no, it's like, you know, if he's like, what are you looking for? I mean, what yeah. are they, yeah, what are they looking, at, looking yeah, for? You know, for, yeah, they're looking for signs of you know, microbes. We're all looking at yeah, microbes yeah. or you know, and advanced saying, well, species. It's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look. For, yeah. Let's look for. Let's look for. But you know, waste products of of industry. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, you know, we're so, we're such a young solar system compared to a lot of what is out there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that something didn't develop and blow itself up. Like, you know, we probably will, or it seemed like we're heading that way. I don't know. But I mean, yeah. that's, that's Not one of, wood, that's yeah. one of the things. Yeah. That's one of the things that, you know, the civilizations, you think about all the extinctions on this planet. And then you think about all the possible extinctions on other planets and for, us to match up to an intelligent race, you know, somewhere or a highly intelligent race is possible, but still, there's still, you know, when you think about the way the patterns of time is and how, you know, minuscule a time we have been on this planet compared to how long the planet's been here. Yeah, and, uh, civilizations you know, it's, can, can miss each other very easily, yes. Yeah. I mean, there are those, those mm -hmm. kind of algorithms and models of, of uh, yeah, it is, it's, we could we could exist in a just a gap where we couldn't talk to something and something out there might not want to talk to us or there might be well and gone by now or agree that that's um, that would be a bummer but uh, it's certainly you know possible um, but I I I lean I lean toward uh, we're in a universe teeming with life yeah. I'm just not sure we can interact with it yet. Um, yeah. Or that or I had a in uh, interacting with us. Yeah. Well, obviously, I think there yeah. is something interacting with us. We don't know if it's actually I, I do. It came from somewhere or not. You know, I, I do, too. I had a, another astrophysicist, I believe she was on um, not that long ago, a few months ago. And I believe I don't want to misquote her, but I believe she said that statistically in our galaxy, we have up to 40 billion Earth-like planets, you know, just by using the methods and and the math of what we've mm. seen so far. I mean, you yeah. think about it, 40 billion in just our galaxy, and one yeah, of we're just one probably galaxy. trillions of galaxies, yeah. you know. And if they can figure out how to travel um, in a way that we can't even comprehend, you know, maybe we are being visited from very, very far away. Who's yeah. to say? Well, you know, the, I don't think it's impossible. There's nope. the uh, discussion that the distance itself is an illusion. Um, hmm. You know that that you know it you know is um, an emerging property of the universe that might not actually be real, uh, and could be uh, an illusion created by entanglement. Um, that, that there oh. really is there really is no in space itself. Uh, there is no distance. You know it's a uh, wow. It's a construct that we have. So this other species, you know, may not be confined by the notion of distance at all. Wow. Yeah, there's so much to think about. So many excellent uh, theories on everything. Here's another question here. Have you guys seen the patent for the anti-gravity triangle shaped spacecraft? Uh, have you seen that? The uh, that was um, that was from the pay, Navy. Pay, what's his name? Pay, I believe. Pay, pay us, pay us, right? I don't, yeah. I don't remember right. the name of it, but I remember, uh, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, this patent the Navy had was for anti-gravity. Yeah. And it was triangular. And it's, it's the thing. Yeah. I, I'm interested, but it's, I think it's, it seems like the sort of thing. Um, well, for one that you can, you can, you can uh, get a patent without actually being able to build something. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Well, you can patent it, yeah. but, but the thing that's missing is the energy source. Uh, that could drive it. Uh, yeah. I mean, just to a certain extent, um, Da Vinci basically did a, you know, had a patent out for the helicopter. Um, you right. Know, uh, that circular thing. Yeah. 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 You know, he basically the corkscrew put, thing. Put it yeah. out. You know, said this would work if we could power it. Um, yeah. And it would have. You know, if you know, if you could power it. I I, I I listen. I don't specifically know about that patent or have seen it and i agree with dave that there's things I, I would say there's also a lot of evidence probably hiding in plain sight that we will you know that when the truth is out we'll turn around and realize oh my gosh you know like that that uh image i mean i i tell this story from 
<laughs> tell this story from uh, the the Saul Foundation. I, I said it when Dave and I were kind of recapping, but um, I walked past a kind of notable, uh, let's call him a gatekeeper, somebody who's one of these sort of old old time in the know, would know a hell of a lot more than me, physicist type who was in a conversation with just someone from the conference, but I was just going to the restroom, but I just walked past and I heard this said, well, you know, the autopsy photos are real. And, um, and, and I, I, I sort of hesitated and I was like, what, 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 which, which ones, what are we, what are we talking about? Which, which photo? I did not intrude on the conversation because as Dave and I were both a little nervous that first day, it didn't feel appropriate to, but I, it was the kind of thing where I was like, well, well, hell, um, you know, there just might be more to what's out there than we know, or things that have been dismissed. But, uh, I found that kind of an interesting little nugget. That's, that's great. Well, wow. and which I'm sure you know, the alien autopsy film mm -hmm. is uh, was a hoax. Yes, I mean I recall yeah. the cutting. Out, it was in the '90s, I think. They were carving yeah, up. That yeah, yeah. There was San, Santino, Santino. I can't remember. Uh, made a cup, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars off that film, and he's still out there, you know, saying it as real. Yeah. So what are your? Here's another one from uh, Web Plowin. And he wants to know, what are y'all's thoughts on the Gary McKinnon and his claims? Are you familiar with him, the hacker? The, the English. He hacked using yeah. AOL, you know, a dial-up. He was using dial-up in, in England, I think. Yeah, and he's been fighting Supposedly hacked. extradition ever since. Right, um, yeah. The US I don't know Canada. this story. Yeah, he yeah he was, uh, when he was a kid, a teenager, right? He hacked into yeah. uh, Pentagon computers. Yep. And came Which up is quite probably. amazing that that could even happen. And he was yeah. able to quickly down. He was well quickly in those days. He was able <laughs> to download part of a document about about UFOs, right? Yeah. And uh, but like uh, at that in that era, downloading a, a page of text could take several minutes. Um. And, but but exactly. uh, and uh, but ever since then, he's been. Uh, hounded by the american government several administrations later oh wow uh, they've been they've been trying to extradite him ever since uh to basically try to throw him in jail for 100 years is their plan um well he's gonna they're doing a documentary on him now i don't know if you heard that no i didn't no no That'd yeah interesting. i don't know when that's i don't know the the whole story when that's going to come out or anything but here's a thank you Fascinating. um from jordan thank you so much for having dave and tom and a positive conversation, such an elusive and many times dangerous subject without prejudice. Thank you all. Oh, well, and, thank, uh, you. thank you. It's been a real pleasure, guys. And uh, hang out. Don't go away when we say goodbye, if you would, just for a minute. And, Absolutely. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. And Great where to can see we, you. Where can we find – do you have actually have a web separate website for your show, or is it just – YouTube channel. You know, yeah, go to uh, at really with Tom and Dave on YouTube is sort of our port of call where you can see clips okay. and all our shows are lined up and uh, and all of that. And we yeah, have we a, actually have a web page too. We, we have a Patri YouTube Patreon. Now. We have stuff. We're very oh. bad at this, but uh, yeah. we're we're learning. We're growing. We're we're getting there. But uh, mm -hmm. support yeah. us in all those ways that you can. Come see us. Um, we uh, we'd love to have you. And um, and Martin, always always a pleasure to speak with you, sir. Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. And you guys have some top notch guests. I should, you know, you. we should get that out there. You have some great guests. We've been so, very lucky. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Very fun. Yeah. And it's super interesting and learning all the time. And uh, yeah. we still haven't been able to figure out how we got into the Soul Foundation thing. Uh, no, we think it was a misprint. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll take <laughs> it. Yeah. I think yeah. They thought, I and think if they, they do thought, it next year, I'll certainly yes. see you guys there. I think they yeah. thought they were getting David Spade. Yeah. I think that was it. I think that was it. <laughs> Yeah, Close enough. That sense. yeah, yeah. All right, all right, guys. We'll see you later. And right. next week we have uh, Garrett Graff coming on. And thank you all, everyone. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. <laughs>